Coming in at number 10 today, it's Luke Cage's impenetrable skin. Thanks to the super soldier experiment known as the bursting process, Luke Cage Power Man does have incredible strength, stamina, and a healing factor, but he is pretty much most known for the fact that he is protected by indestructible, impenetrable, super dense skin. That is an awesome power to have. Luke is protected from almost anything with this titanium like skin, but the problem here is that this natural shield isn't just shielding him from the outside. Whenever Luke Cage is internally injured, which is rarely, the character requires more than almost anyone else ever would. It's next to impossible to perform surgery on Luke Cage unless you happen to have access to an overpowered medical laser. The natural ways someone might be healed from some kind of internal injury do not apply as doctors can't even cut through Cage's skin to begin the procedure in the first place. As you can imagine, this can be pretty problematic. In a 9, 50% off sales. Captain Margaret Elizabeth or Peggy Carter was a distinguished Avenger and founding member of the Illuminati, who played a crucial role in the Infinity War of 2018 of our world, where she valiantly fought against Thanos and aided during the Battle of Titan. In the aftermath, when Doctor Strange utilized the Darkhold for dreamwalking, resulting in a multiversal threat of, you know, incursions, Carter, along with the rest of the Illuminati, voted in favor of executing him to safeguard their universe. In the years that followed, Carter found herself residing over a hearing concerning an alternate version of Doctor Strange who was apprehended by Baron Mordo on suspicions of posing a similar danger. Before the vote could be finalized though, to condemn this alternate Doctor Strange, their headquarters came under attack by the Scarlet Witch. Carter and her fellow Illuminati confronted her, uh, but tragically uh, she met her demise when Scarlet Witch used her own shield to cut her in half, hence the 50% off sale. The amount of times that Cap has caught his shield though makes me question why Carter was able to be cut in half by hers. Number 8. Chickens or Electorophobia. The mutant Domino is pretty darn unique. Her mutant ability allows her to subliminally and psionically initiate random kinetic phenomena that affect probability in her favor by making improbable, but importantly not impossible, things to occur within her line of sight. What does that mean? Basically she has good luck. Really, really good luck. So how do you give a weakness to someone with such a strange and honestly powerful power as luck? Easy. You make her absolutely terrified of chickens. Now obviously not a lot of people are running across chickens very often and I think that holds true for superheroes, but for someone with such super powered luck as Domino, she runs into chickens more than should be acceptable. And that's pretty unlucky because her fear of chickens is quite debilitating. In its 7 chewing gum, the Justice Buster bat suit is a mech suit that's part of Batman's Fenrir contingency, which is designed to take down the entirety of the Justice League if they were to turn bad. Making its feature appearance in Batman Endgame, when the Joker used his Virus to warp the brains of the Justice League at the beginning of this endgame plot, Batman was forced to use the Fender protocol to eliminate the teammates, or well, to at least subdue them. The suit was successful in eliminating Wonder Woman, The Flash, and Aquaman, but men even matched the hands of Superman. After a lengthy fight, Superman tore through the armor and nearly killed Batman until Bruce used kryptonite chewing gum to spit in Clark's face, rendering him unconscious. Come on, okay? Imagine waking up to learn that you passed out because Batman spit on your face. Seriously, please, brush your tongue, okay? You get one of those tongue scrapers. Your breath is lethal. Not to mention the miniaturized red suns for knuckles. They didn't help. You had to spit kryptonite chewing gum. Number 6. Ethyl Chloride Ethyl Chloride, a common compound found in pesticides and bug sprays, is essentially Spider-Man's kryptonite, and it severely impairs his senses. This makes ethyl chloride extremely powerful against Spider-Man. It's one of his biggest weaknesses, but yet ethyl chloride isn't being used by all of his villains all the time, even though it's actually a very common compound. The big reason why it doesn't show up much is that ethyl chloride is considered to be so supremely powerful against Spider-Man that there was a momentary ban placed on the substance by Marvel writers. It was literally becoming too easy to bring down Spidey, so writers got lazy and used it as a crutch just way too many times. Amazing Spider-Man number 106 has Spider-Man engaging in battle with the Spider Slayer Mark IV, which had the villainous addition of ethyl chloride. After trapping Spider-Man in a web, Smythe, the guy who created it, uses his machine to douse Peter with a cloud of the compound, and Spider-Man is weakened by the spray and finds himself unable to move, giving his enemies the chance to strike. Number 5. Cypher. Cypher I'd like to rank a 
little bit lower on this list because calling him weak feels kind of unfair considering how integral he's been lately in regards to helping kickstart Krakoa, especially in the comics. But Cypher is still one of those characters that people attribute as being weak because of his power set, and so for that reason, I'm still gonna count him here. But of course, his powers actually happen to be some of the most useful in the comics. It's a kind of like a misunderstanding, especially when we consider that they also apply to Cypher being able to communicate with tech and using his ability to understand and communicate in all kinds of languages to become a skilled fighter, which has been interpreted by certain writers as its own language, so Cypher can also be great at fighting. However, not all writers seem to be able to agree on this point, because some people have also seemingly forgot that Cypher is supposed to be really great at fighting. <laughs> Number four, Tracy 13. Tracy 13 is a magic user who isn't as well known as others like Zatanna, John Constantine, or Dr. Fate from DC Comics. And in that regard, considering she hasn't had as much of a chance to prove herself, she could be considered weak. That being said, she still is a magic user and one who is the daughter of both a magical skeptic and a powerful sorceress, meaning that she possesses both the knowledge of when to be doubtful about someone's prowess and skills and the natural aptitude to perform magic herself, learning from her mother before her mother passed away. In the primer's continuity, the type of magic that Tracy uses is actually known as urban magic, which allows her to fuel her abilities through the power and spirit of sprawling and built-up cities. Personally, I also think that's just like a super cool, like niche magic thing, urban magic. Number three, dupe. Unsurprisingly, yes, a lot of seemingly weak heroes who actually happen to have pretty impressive powers come from the mutant camp of Marvel Comics. Although I don't know if it's ever actually been cemented exactly what dupe is at all, whether that be mutant or something else entirely. Maybe an alien, who knows. However, dupe has definitely found a home with the mutant, so I think we'd still consider him to be an honorary mutant at the very least if we wanted. Dupe has to be one of the weirdest characters of all time, especially when it comes to his storylines. Dupe is also weirdly romantic for a floating green alien language speaking creature that was possibly created as a result of government experimentation. Kind of looks like a jelly bean. Yet also somehow he has a mother. Dupe is a ridiculous character, but when he needs to, he seems to be able to exhibit almost any superpower one could think of. Number two, Booster Gold. Booster Gold could be considered weak because his powers aren't even really powers that he was born with or incurred from a wacky lab accident gone wrong or like worked really hard to earn like abilities, but instead are fueled by technology that he stole in the future, which is where, or rather when, he's from the future. He used tech to travel to the past and with his knowledge of the past as well, aimed to become a hero in that time period. There, Booster used his tech as well as his knowledge from the future to try and become a hero. And well, he succeeded! Hooray! However, just because Booster can do things like time travel doesn't mean he's always the best at heroics. Case in point, the time he tried to give a gift to Batman and Catwoman in honor of their wedding. His gift was to travel back in time and prevent Bruce's parents from being lost to him all those years ago. But in so so doing this also prevented Bruce and Selena from ever getting together and also caused well, a lot of other problems. I mean, Batman wouldn't be Batman without that loss, right? Potentially. Yes, actually, I think that story confirmed that. Number one, Squirrel Girl. Squirrel Girl is one of my all-time favorite heroes, even if some out there consider her to be weak sauce. Not me, though. I see her true strength. But I can't ignore the fact that on paper, her powers, her mutation, well, it all does sound pretty ridiculous. And she should, by all intents and purposes, not be as OP as we know her to be. However, that being said, I feel like we need to acknowledge the fact that Doreen's abilities, or more specifically, her people skills, are honestly insanely powerful. Squirrel Girl has the ability to befriend pretty much anyone, no matter their alignment. And she is really, and I mean, really good at helping convince criminals to call it quits, either for the day or honestly, for like the rest of their entire lives. Number 10, Martian Manhunter and Fire. Now I'm not gonna lie, I am also not the biggest fan of Fire either, and I would absolutely hate being set on fire for so many reasons. But for such a powerful hero who can shapeshift at a molecular level, change his entire genetic makeup to let him pass through solid objects, withstand ferocious attacks, or bend light waves around his body, it just seems a little silly, right? Not to mention that he comes from Mars, otherwise known as the Red Planet or the Fire Star. So why is this one of his biggest weaknesses? Well, long before Martian Manhunter even existed, a race of aliens known as the Burning caused some serious damage with fire in order to create their offspring, which, needless to say, people weren't too happy about. After the Guardians of the Universe separated the offspring into the White Martians and the Green Martians, they were all imbued with a congenital pyrophobia, aka a fear of fire. So it kind of makes sense why he's so afraid of it. 
Not only does it physically hurt him, but it also scrambles his most prized weapon of all, his mind. This fear and weakness is so intense that when he's exposed to flame, he has the capacity to self-destruct, either combusting into bits or dissolving into rivers of Martian liquid. Want to know more about the Martian Manhunter? Well then check him out in his first appearance in 1986's Justice League of America, number 255. Number 9, The Flash and Being Too Fast. At first, I've got to say this one confused me so much because that's kind of the Flash's whole thing, right? Well, when it comes to Barry Allen, his speed might be his greatest strength, but being too fast puts his life in mortal danger. In Crisis on Infinite Earths, we see the Flash use his super speed to thwart the Anti-Monitor's evil plan, but the speed vortex he creates to stop the villain's Anti-Matter cannon from firing is so fast that it sweeps the Flash away along with it. He ends up being stranded for 23 years in the Speed Force, you know that mystical energy field that gives all the speedsters their powers, and spends that whole time running and trying to figure out how to get back. Basically, what happened is that Barry ran way too fast for his body to handle and he atomized himself. Thought to be dead by his closest friends, including Wally West, who took up the Flash mantle in his absence, Barry's apparent death was a huge shock for everyone, and also entirely his own fault. Check out more of The Flash for yourself, starting with his first appearance in 1956's Showcase, number 4. Number 8, Power Girl and Raw Materials. You'd think that being weak to kryptonite would be their only weakness, considering how easy it seemed for people to get their hands on it. But Kara Zor L from Earth 2 actually had another pretty big weakness at one point. They were vulnerable to unprocessed natural materials such as branches and rocks for a short while. This also includes stone, dirt, and sand. Basically anything that can be found on Earth that isn't man-made. In Peter David's Supergirl Volume 4 number 16, she gets knocked to the ground and impaled by a pretty big tree branch, which in her defense would put anyone on the ground. Supergirl helps yank out the branch, and with this weirdly sociopathic smile on her face, she asked, what, are you vulnerable to wood? It took a second, but after she was no longer in pain, she replied, worse, to any raw, unprocessed natural materials. So, sticks and stones really can break my bones. <sighs> God, dumb joke and even dumber weakness. Check her out for yourself in her first appearance in 2011's Flashpoint, Volume 2, Number 5. Number 7, Adam Strange and Forced Deportation. Who knew that archaeologists could also be superheroes? Well, apparently Adam Strange did because that is exactly what he is. He inadvertently found himself on the planet Ran and was gifted with all the powers of a superhero in mystery and space. And it's not exactly explained why. Sounds pretty great, right? I mean, what could possibly be his weakness? Well, it's not actually his fault or in his control. This life of bliss he lives on Ran is frequently interrupted by his rather inconvenient transportations back to Earth, where he has no powers at all. The technology responsible for bringing him to Ran, the Zeta Beam, only allows him to remain there for as long as it's transmitting back to Earth. And as it takes the Beam a few good years to reach Strange's home planet, it's not exactly easy to catch a ride back. Strange might have been recruited as Rand's savior, but his timing issues really make this role more of a temporary gig. He could be midway through his heroics before vanishing without a single trace. He even left his wife to nearly get eaten by a tiger once. Luckily, as Alan Moore's Swamp Thing series clarified, the Randians are more than capable of looking after themselves when Strange isn't around, and thank goodness for that because I wouldn't be relying on Strange much either. Give his story a read for yourself, starting with 1986's Outsiders, number 6. Number 6, Human Torch and Asbestos. Now, don't get me wrong, Johnny Storm, aka the Human Torch, is a force to be reckoned with. Not only can he create, absorb, and manipulate fire, which is pretty awesome on its own, but his Nova Flame is hot enough to vaporize the particles of anything in his way, whether it's a bullet, a building, a bad guy, etc. Interestingly enough, though, his powers can't seem to penetrate asbestos. Now, this doesn't seem like much of a weakness now, given that asbestos is now banned across most of the world, but back when the Human Torch was first created by Stanley and Ernest Hart in 1963, it was a much more common thing, as it was used to insulate pipes and wires, soundproof rooms, and even make cheap garden furniture. In Strange Tales number 111, Asbestos Man came into play, dialed up Johnny Storm, and arranged a showdown between the two. The Human Torch wasn't really all that into it, but he agreed nonetheless and showed up completely underprepared. Asbestos Man used his super asbestos suit, a fire retardant shield, and a fisherman's net to go toe to toe with the Human Torch, and he wreaked havoc on the Human Torch until he developed mesothelioma and needed an oxygen tank to stay alive. Moral of the story, kids, is always prepare for anything, and please, don't breeze asbestos. Check out more of the Human Torch's story, starting with 1961's Fantastic Four, number one. Number five, Wonder Woman and being tied up. Superheroes don't come much more kick than Wonder Woman. She's an extremely skilled warrior with enough power to take on the gods and win, and she's shown time and time again that she can hold her own in the world of comic book heroes. However, the Golden Age Wonder Woman was bound by an interesting Amazonian rule that really did not work in her favor. 
Known as Aphrodite's Law, it states that when an Amazon girl permits a man to chain her braces of submission together, she becomes weak as other women in a man rule world. This gender specific weakness lasted from Wonder Woman's debut in 1942 right through to the mid 80s, when DC finally retconned this out for good. This weakness is less literal than metaphorical, meant to demonstrate Marston's argument that women are only vulnerable to men when they choose to be. But still, I am very glad that this has gotten rid of for good. Check out Wonder Woman more for yourself, starting with her first appearance in 1942's All-Star Comics, Volume 1, Number 8. Number 4, Gladiator and Self-Confidence. Cal Ark, aka Gladiator, is arguably one of the most powerful comic book heroes ever. Gifted with planet-shattering strength, super speed, heat vision, frost breath, and a few psionic abilities as well. He's a superhero anyone would love to be. However, even though he is loved, he never really learned to love himself, and that is sometimes his biggest downfall. Although low self-esteem isn't exactly fun for anyone, trust me, I know, for Gladiator it's actually a fatal weakness. His power fluctuates according to his confidence, as seen in Dan Abnett's and Andy Lanning's War of Kings crossover in 2009. Get him to doubt himself or even his abilities for one second and he can be defeated by opponents with far weaker abilities than him. A prime example of this is shown in War of Kings number 3 when Rocket Raccoon manages to convince Glider his gun will hurt himself and despite withstanding far worse in the past, succumbs to self-fulfilling prophecy and is beaten. Give his story a read for yourself starting with 1977's X-Men number 107. Number 3, Daredevil and Loud Noises. Now we all likely know this, but Matt Murdock's loss of vision took away the natural gift of eyesight that we all take for granted, and replaced it with echolocation, an uncanny radar sense that allows him to basically see things through sound. Unfortunately for many heroes, their greatest strength can also be their greatest weakness, and such is the case for Daredevil, as his extreme sensitivity to sound can completely incapacitate him. In Daredevil Volume 2 West Case Scenario, he is subjected to a high decibel ultrasound, 120 decibels to be exact, by the dastardly Purple Man. Who knows his weapon is excruciating for a man of Daredevil's gift. Daredevil's head spins and he looks like a man under a sorcerer's spell, leaving him completely vulnerable to a follow-up attack. The same can actually be done using intense smells as well, since his sense of smell was also heightened after losing his eyesight. Although Daredevil can and does go toe-to-toe -to -toe with pretty much anyone in a fight, he will get utterly emasculated by a stink bomb or a supersonic sound. Check out more of Matt Murdock for yourself, starting with his first appearance in 1964's Daredevil, number one. Loud noises! Number two, Green Lantern and Wood. If you're a bit confused, that is totally okay. This is not a weakness that is common across all of the Green Lanterns. It's specific to the very first Green Lantern, Alan Scott. Despite being armed with a magical ring and a spectrum of pretty much limitless powers, Scott seemed to have another fatal weakness other than the color yellow. He first realized that this might be a problem for him after he was hit in the face with a wooden log. And then after a series of wins and victory laps, Scott realized tree bark might be his potential undoing. Put a little more succinctly, items made of wood cannot be lifted or broken by energy from the ring, nor can barriers of emerald energy stop projectiles crafted from wood. Apparently this vulnerability to wood was because the green flame was an incarnation of green growing things, and thus could not be turned against them. Guess you could say he, uh, can't get wood. <laughs> Check out the first Green Lantern for yourself, starting with 1940's All-American Comics, number 16. Number 1, Captain Marvel Jr. and his own name. Poor, poor Freddie Freeman. Out of all of the weaknesses on this list today, he probably drew the shortest straw because his weakness is his own name. If Captain Marvel Jr. tries to introduce himself to a superpowered ally or for some reason feels the need to say his name in the middle of a battle, he'll instantly be transformed back into Freddie Freeman, a ordinary young lad who relies on a crutch to walk. Or if he speaks his superhero alias aloud in the guise of Freddie Freeman, he'll transform into a shimmering beacon of muscly justice and give himself away. Jerry Ordway tried tried getting around this flaw during Captain Marvel Jr.'s sporadic appearances in Teen Titans between 1995 and 1998 by having Freeman refer to himself as CM3, since he was one of the three members of the Captain Marvel family at the time. Also, he could avoid accidental transformations, but that change didn't really stick around. Honestly, for someone who inspired many of Elvis's onstage looks, that is one weakness that I don't know if I can overlook. Check him out for yourself in his first DC appearance in 1995's The Power of Shazam, number three. Halfway through into number five, breathing. If I said Batman versus Hulk, I think we should all agree, unless you're in denial on the outcome, right? 
Talk about a one-sided fight. Batman standing up to Superman is one thing. They share a universe, you can get kryptonite, whatever. But Batman and the Hulk, no. Unfortunately though, they have gone toe to toe and surprisingly, Batman achieved the impossible feat of defeating Hulk. In the harmonious days of 1981, when DC and Marvel were on friendly terms and the concept of separate universes hadn't really come to fruition, they occasionally collaborated on crossover stories. One such amusing tale unfolded in DC special series number 27, written by the late Len Wein and illustrated by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. In the extraordinary encounter, Batman unexpectedly crossed paths with a rampaging Hulk, manipulated by the Joker to view Batman as a villain. The Hulk turned his fury towards the Cape Crusader, and Batman, recognizing the immense power of his opponent, somehow skillfully evaded Hulk's fists with every move, because you know, one hit would kill him. With calculated precision, Batman then deployed a pellet of knockout gas, which was disorienting the Hulk, but you know, not knocking him out, because it's the Hulk. Exploiting a moment of weakness, Batman incapacitated the Jade Giant by kicking him in the gut, forcing Hulk to inhale. That's right. Yeah, Batman kicked Hulk in the gut and actually made him flinch. Number four, Asbestos. Johnny Storm, the Human Torch, was one of my favorite superheroes as a kid. He can create, absorb, and manipulate fire, which is pretty awesome. His Nova Flame is hot enough to vaporize the particles of anything in his way, except of course for Asbestos. Now, thankfully, in our modern world, we know that asbestos is pretty incredibly toxic and it's totally banned across most of the world. But you see, back when the Human Torch was first created in 1963, it was used to insulate pipes and wires, soundproof rooms, and even make cheap garden furniture. And the Human Torch was wide open to asbestos based attacks. Specifically, though, the Torch has found himself going up against villains based on the stuff Asbestos Lady and Asbestos Man. Both of these villains made use of asbestos based outfits or armor and tools of the trade. But like I said, we know this stuff to be incredibly toxic, but we didn't know that then. So as time went on, Asbestos Lady, aka Victoria Murdoch, passed on from idiopathic mesothelioma at age 45, presumably from asbestos exposure, and Asbestos Man was forced to start wearing an oxygen mask and presumably also passed on due to his asbestos exposure. I guess they also had a weakness to the stuff, huh? RIP. RIP in the chat. Getting close to the end of number three, Bullets. Now, with the Flash being the fastest man alive, you'd expect him to, you know, be able to react to things. And while this weakness isn't exactly showcased with the Scarlet Speedster in a meaningful way, it is certainly demonstrated well by his counterpart, the Reverse Flash. Imagine our surprise when Reverse Flash ends up getting popped in the head by none other than Thomas Wayne in the Flashpoint timeline, so that Barry could access enough speed force to save the world and bring his son back. Batman shot Reverse Flash in the head. And while this apparently killed Thawne, um, that was far from the end of the story, because Thawne started vibrating as fast as he could to slow the destruction of his brain. This gave him more time to avoid death and gave him the ability to hold a grudge. But seriously, shooting a speedster in the head has to be one of the dumbest ways a speedster has been defeated. And that's including the entirety of the Flash TV series, even the final season where he shakes hands with the negative speed force. Number two, yellow. Never eat the yellow snow. It's a rule that a lot of us know. While that may be a statement made to stop small children from consuming human or animal pee, I think it would be a perfect saying to introduce into the Green Lantern Corps. Hal Jordan has protected the Earth from interplanetary threats with his incredibly powerful ring and his incredibly powerful will. And yet, you face him armed with a handful of buttercups and he is rendered practically useless. According to the comics, an impurity in the ring's power source meant that Jordan became powerless when faced with the color yellow. This was later expanded by Jeff Johns' Green Lantern Rebirth as being tied to Parallax, a yellow fear entity who was locked in the central power battery, thus weakening it. Now, when you say it like that, it begins to make, I guess, a little bit more sense. But before this was revealed, though, Green Lantern's weakness was just dumb. And it still kind of is. This is no more evident than in All Star Batman and Robin by Frank Miller, specifically issue number nine, when the Cape Crusader trapped Hal Jordan in a yellow painted room and let a yellow suited Robin go to town on him. And this is all because it's the dumbest weakness we have ever heard. Of. Bruce Wayne said it himself, so it has to be true. And it was all yellow. And finally, in at number one, Wood. Wow, look at that. Green Lantern number one and number two. Throughout the years, Green Lantern has encountered various weaknesses.
is tied to his powers, okay? Like, yellow. But one particular vulnerability has been overlooked by most comic writers, mostly because it's specific to the Alan Scott version. Green Lanterns, they use their powers, they use them to fly, communicate in different languages, create energy constructs, or will constructs, I guess, because, you know, green. But, you know, you have to balance it out somehow. So, uh, in Alan Scott's case, wood was the chosen weakness. It has an explanation, and it stems from the subconscious belief that his abilities couldn't affect the material, and that's literally it. He didn't have the belief that he could do anything to wood, so he couldn't. Which just showcases that belief is the most powerful superpower of all. Unless you're facing against a number two pencil, which I guess would actually take Take out both of them. Number 10, Detective Chimp. Detective Chimp might just be a chimp who also isn't necessarily known for his fighting prowess and strength, but he's also an extremely intelligent chimp who is considered to be one of the greatest detectives Earth actually has. Not only that, but he's also been tied to the realm of mysticism after he gained the Sword of Night. And friends, before I move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to let us know that you love us by clicking that like button. Seriously, it feeds the algorithm. Feed the algorithm. Number nine, Forge. Forge is kind of squishy in comparison to some other physically tougher and more durable heroes out there, which is why he makes our cut here. And he's not particularly well known for his fighting prowess, but he is well known for making cool stuff, especially cool weapons. And because of that, he is actually extremely useful. Many also forget that Forge has experience with shamanism and not only has a mutant origin, but an origin that is also attached to the world of magic magic and mysticism, which honestly is pretty cool. However, for those who want to argue that Forge could march in there alongside someone like Cyclops, I think he'd actually prefer to outfit someone like Cyclops to march into action in his stead, but super souped up so that Psych alone could stand in for a whole small army of heroes and of course, Forge himself. Be like, I'll just make you super cool, you go in there, and then it's basically like there's two of us because you're gonna be that cool. Number eight. Fury. This version of Fury we're focusing on here is mainly known by the name of Lita Hall. This version of the character had her origin changed following the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths. Instead of being Diana Prince, Wonder Woman, and Steve Trevor's daughter, she would become known as the daughter of Helena Cosmatos, also Fury, who was raised instead by Admiral Derek Trevor and Miss America, aka Joan Dale Trevor. In the Sandman universe, she was once the partner of Hector Hall, and the two were going to have a child together when Hector tragically dies. While dead in the real world, Hector's consciousness becomes suspended in a pocket of the dreaming, with Brute and Glob turning him into their new Sandman after Dream's imprisonment. Lita is visited by Hector in her dreams and eventually chooses to stay with him there, but because their child is conceived in the dreaming, he ends up being claimed by the dream lord Morpheus once he himself returns. He forces Hector's spirit to move on and explains that one day he will come for Lita's child, who belongs to the dreaming. Despite her Amazonian like abilities, Lita can be seen as weak in the traditional superhero sense, as she doesn't act as a hero in Neil Gaiman's Sandman series, and instead attempts to pursue a simple, normal life with her son. However, she gets insane anxiety when it comes to being separated from him at any moment because of Dream's threat to one day claim him. Number seven, Dazzler. Dazzler is here not because of how weak she seems, but because of how truly incredible her powers are. The only thing that really makes her seemingly useless is the fact that Alison Blair typically prefers to use her powers for her performances as opposed to being, you know, the team leader for the X-Men, which honestly, she easily could be, and actually has been in regards to multiversal teams that exist. She's played the role of leader before, both with her band and with her fellow mutant heroes, but not for the main X-Men team. No, no, no. Dazzler has powers that have been described before to be potentially unlimited in terms of just how much damage she could do. She can transmute sound into light, and while her light shows in her concerts might seem kind of tame, she has also used her power set to defeat and defend against heavy hitters like Ulysses Claw, who she permanently defeated, Enchantress, and the Hulk. Number six, Witchfire. I think Witchfire is a super cool hero. She not only looks cool, but she also is a magical hero, one of the most powerful kinds out there if 
you ask me. One of them. Not, not the only one, but definitely one of my tops. But still, among those who are gifted with magic, which fires Rebecca Carstairs usually ends up being regarded as lower on the totem pole. I'm sure there are actually many of you out there who aren't even familiar with this character. And to show how tragically weak she is, shortly after her first appearance in the Prime Earth continuity, she's permanently defeated, with her soul ending up being trapped after the complete destruction of her physical body. Pretty tragic, really, because I just feel like she's so cool. How could you do her like that? Number 10. Batman's inability to trust. For a superhero with no powers, Batman is able to do remarkably well against much more powerful villains and is able to stand next to some of the most powerful heroes in the DC Universe without looking out of place. And while yes, technically you could count the fact that he's susceptible to being shot or stabbed as a weakness, his greatest weakness is his inability to trust anyone, even his closest allies. Batman is constantly finding himself in situations where he doesn't give his allies the full picture and as a result, he or his teammates are put in unnecessary danger. The most famous example of this comes from the Tower of Babel storyline, when it was revealed that Batman had developed detailed plans about how to destroy each of his friends and teammates. Ra's al Ghul managed to steal these plans and do a lot of damage to the heroes before Batman realized what was happening. Frankly, it is only through dumb luck that none of the League members were killed in this incident. When the dust settled, the team was furious with Batman for breaching their trust and putting all of them in danger. As the writer of the story, Mark Wade, recently said in an interview where he talked about this arc, Batman's sin to the Justice League was not that he had these plans to counteract each of them. It was that he didn't tell them. If he had just said to Superman, listen, just in case you want to know, I have a backup in case you ever go nuts. Superman would go, awesome, that's good to hear. This is a lesson that Batman has yet to really absorb, despite the amount of times his secrecy has blown up in his face, such as when he kept the Batman who laughs prisoner under the Hall of Justice without telling anyone. Number 9. Zatanna has to be able to speak Zatanna is a stage magician who happens to be capable of real magic. She is capable of casting powerful enchantments that can range from turning enemies into rabbits or a erasing their memories. She casts these spells by saying what she wants backwards. For example, when she wants to turn rain into flowers, she says Niar Semo Keb Suru Wolf. The one limitation on this power is that to cast these spells, she has to be able to speak the incantations. So unlike other magic wielding characters like say Doctor Strange who could cast a spell by wordlessly waving their hands, if someone manages to gag Zatanna, she is incapable of doing anything to further defend herself. As happened when she was captured by the Joker, who slit her throat and threw her into a water tank. However, she was eventually able to heal herself by using blood magic and writing the spell backwards in her own blood. Number 8. Daredevil's radar sense gets confused When Matt Murdock was a young boy, he was hit by a truck that was carrying a radioactive isotope. This isotope got in his eyes and blinded him, but also heightened his other senses, allowing him to develop his trademark radar sense, which helps him navigate the world and fight crime as Daredevil. While this does give him several advantages, it is also prone to being overstimulated by kind of random things. For example, if he ends up underwater, he can easily lose his bearings and have trouble telling up from down. Even worse though is his weakness to rain. This weakness is kind of inconsistent, as in other versions of the character, like the Ben Affleck movie, rain allows him to see things more clearly, but in the comics it is a serious handicap for the character. In issue 25 of the 2011 Daredevil series, Matt is fighting a villain named Ikari who has a similar radar sense. The fight leads them to a sporting goods store where Matt's narration reveals that he has always been worried that a villain will someday think to use a sprinkler system against him, as rain negates his sense of smell, overwhelms his hearing, and makes his radar sense practically useless, cutting his by 95%. Considering how often it seems to rain in Marvel's New York and how dependent Daredevil is on his radar sense, this is a pretty rough weakness. Number 7. Black Canary if she gets a sore throat Dinah Lance is the second hero to use the alias of Black Canary, with her mother being the first. While her mother was limited to being a capable hand-to-hand -hand fighter and being able to train canaries to do amazing feats, her daughter has the ability to unleash the powerful canary cry. How she manages this varies depending on the continuity, with it sometimes being a byproduct of a wizard's curse and sometimes being due to her carrying the metahuman gene. But what the power does remains consistent. The canary cry allows Dinah to control her voice vocal cords to generate a powerful sonic attack that can deafen her opponents and when she really lets loose, can destroy metal and even kill people. However, she needs to be in good vocal health to achieve this, and if she ever has laryngitis, she is unable to unleash the canary cry. 
However, even without the cry, she is one of the best martial artists in the DC Universe, so she still manages okay. Number 6. Wolverine's Metal Skeleton Wolverine has always been a powerful mutant, sporting claws, and a healing factor that makes him practically unkillable. Between that and his super acute senses, his more than a century of combat training, and his berserker rage, he is not someone you want as an enemy. These abilities got an upgrade when the Weapon X program got a hold of him and coated his skeleton and claws with an indestructible metal called adamantium. Him. While this does make him even more durable, it does come with certain drawbacks. For example, it does make it much more difficult for Wolverine to swim, and foes often take advantage of this, trapping the clawed Canadian underwater and making him experience the feeling of drowning until he manages to escape. The other drawback to this, of course, is that it makes him vulnerable to magnetism. While this wouldn't be too bad of a weakness for most heroes, I mean, how often do you really come across a giant magnet in the world? Wolverine has the misfortune of being a member of the one superhero team that is constantly fighting against a character who is able to manipulate metal with his mind. At best, this makes him immobile for most of the encounters against Magneto, and at worst, it results in him getting his skeleton torn out. Number 5. Snowbird Can't Leave Canada When the Inuit goddess of the Northern Lights, Nelvana, needed an agent on Earth to help prevent the return of the evil mystical great beasts, she mated with a human and had the shaman, Michael Two Young Men, use his magic to help deliver the child on Earth. Naria was given a decent grab bag of powers, the most notable of which is the ability to transform into any creature found in the Canadian Arctic. She has used this power to become owls, bears, and even whales, which makes her a formidable force against her enemies. However, due to Shaman not being specific enough when casting the spell that bound her spirit to the land, she is somewhat limited in where she can go. If Snowbird goes or is taken beyond the Canadian borders, she grows weak and sick. The longer she is out of Canada, the weaker she gets, and if she stays out of the country too long, she could even die. This weakness was discovered in Alpha Flight number 12 when the team learned that their leader, Guardian, had walked into a trap set by the evil Omega Flight in New York and teleported to his location to try and save him. Snowbird immediately became emaciated and old and nearly died, and was therefore more of a hindrance than a help in this scenario. Snowbird died in a later comic and was eventually brought back, and as a result this weakness seems to have disappeared, as she has since travelled outside of Canada and has even left the planet without any ill effects. Number 4. Martian Manhunter and His Addiction John Jones is an alien from the planet Mars who has insanely strong telepathic powers that allow him to read and control minds. He also has super strength and the ability to shapeshift, and the ability to become intangible and phase through objects, making him a very difficult hero to defeat. For many years, Martian Manhunter had a psychosomatic weakness to fire that would cause him to lose the use of his powers and be burned. This weakness is kind of a problem when you consider how many superhero battles result in buildings or cars catching on fire. But what I want to focus on is a lesser known weakness, his cookie addiction. In Martian Manhunter Volume 2, number 24, we learn that John has developed an intense love of Choco's cookies, the DC equivalent to Oreos. When Blue Beetle and Booster Gold decide to play a prank on him by stealing his cookies and buying all the Chocos in a mile radius, we learn that when Martian Manhunter goes too long without his fix, he becomes a mindless Hulk-like creature who angrily smashes up the city, screaming about how he needs his cookies. His rampage isn't stopped until Booster Gold and Blue Beetle lead him to a warehouse full of Chocos, where he greedily begins to devour them. Once Manhunter is back to normal, Batman discovers that the chemicals in Chocos, though relatively harmless to human biology, are extremely addictive to Martian physiologies. So yeah, fire is a bad weakness, but a cookie dependency issue is way worse. Number 3. Domino suffers from electorophobia. Nina Thurman has the mutant ability to subconsciously manipulate probability when she finds herself in stressful or dangerous situations in order to give herself the best possible outcome. In simpler terms, she's extremely lucky. If she is shot at, she will instinctively know exactly the right way to duck and dodge her way past the bullets, or the enemy's gun might simply jam. She can make the highly improbable happen in order to survive almost any situation, and it has made her a very difficult character to defeat, but not impossible. In Deadpool Volume 4, number 17, the Merc with a Mouth is planning on assassinating one of the X-Men's most vocal critics in order to earn a place on the team. The X-Men of course do not want to be embroiled in this kind of scandal and send Domino to deal with Deadpool. She ties him to a bed and the two talk with Wade confessing that he is terrified of cows and Domino revealing that she is terrified of chickens. You'd think she was kidding or lying, but later in the issue when Deadpool escapes and goes after the target again, Domino and Wolverine chase after him only to 
to be taken out of commission when crawling through an air vent when they end up face to face with a chicken. Domino is paralyzed with fear and unable to continue on, which delays her and Wolverine long enough for Deadpool to get away. Considering how much poultry seems to affect her, Domino is lucky she doesn't come across them more often. Number 2. Monel and Lead One day, when Superman was just a young super boy, he looked to the sky and saw a crashing rocket. He intercepted it and discovered a young man inside with a locket from Clark's Kryptonian parents, Jor-El and Lara Lorvan, wishing him luck on his travels. The young man had suffered amnesia, but the fact that he had the same powers as Superboy led Clark to deduce that this was his long-lost brother from Krypton. He named him Monel, and the two began fighting crime together while enjoying their newfound sense of family. However, Superboy soon became suspicious of his new brother, as Krypto didn't seem to recognize him, and his belt was made from a metal not found on Krypton's periodic table. As he did a lot in the Silver Age, Clark began putting Monel through a series of elaborate and convoluted tests to prove he was an imposter. He took a bunch of lead balls and painted them green before throwing them into space. He then went to a nearby planet with Monel to play baseball. When the green balls showed up, Superboy pretended they were kryptonite meteors and pretended to be affected. When Monel also began acting sick, Clark took this as proof that he was an imposter, but as Monel's amnesia wore off, he revealed that he was actually from the planet Daxum and had met Jor-El on his travels. As a Daxamite, he had the same powers as Superboy but really did have a vulnerability to lead. While a Kryptonian would return to full health when Kryptonite was removed, a Daxamite exposed to lead was doomed to a slow and painful death. Superboy was forced to put Monel in the Phantom Zone until he could find a cure. Monel has had a few adventures since then as a member of the Legion of Superheroes, but the fact that he could be killed by a relatively common element is pretty dumb. Number one, Aquaman gets dehydrated. As the son of a human and an Atlantean, Arthur Curry is capable of some pretty astounding feats. He is able to survive underwater and swim at incredible speeds. He has super strength and expert fighting skills, as well as the ability to control the oceans when wielding the trident of Poseidon. Oh, and he can also talk to and control fish, an ability that might seem lame until he attacks you with a megalodon. However, he also has a weakness that is pretty silly. If Aquaman doesn't go back in the water every hour, he begins to grow weak and dehydrated. The severity of this weakness depends on who is writing the comic and what continuity you're in, but the Silver Age version of this character was particularly vulnerable. A great example of this is in Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen number one. 115, when Jimmy developed the same powers as Aquaman. A villain impersonating Superman was able to trick Aquaman and Jimmy into entering a competition where they stayed out of the water for an hour and then crawled through the desert trying not to die, as the fake Superman taunted them with a pitcher of water. For those wondering, Jimmy won the competition and was made the new King of Atlantis. After they defeated the villain, he ceded the throne back to Aquaman, but the fact that Jimmy beat him in a nefarious but fair competition, and by rights is the true King of Atlantis, makes you realize why Aquaman has so much trouble being taken seriously. Number 10. Spider-Man Spider-Man is generally known for being one of the most powerful and most iconic heroes out there, but even he has his weaknesses. In fact, while many of them are not as famous as he is, some of them are pretty ridiculous, including his weakness to ethyl chloride, something that also slows and weakens spiders in the natural world. So if you are ever wondering if there might be a bug spray that you could use to fight against Spider-Man, the answer is actually kind of Yes. Although make sure you bring a big spray can of ethyl chloride as he is a lot bigger than your average spider. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you are loving what we are doing here at Top 10 Nerd, why not hit that subscribe button? It really helps us out and you get more of our content. So yay! Number 9. Superman Superman is a character that we generally associate with strength, but not often weakness. Which is interesting considering that he actually has quite a few weaknesses, probably the weirdest among them being magic. The best way to defeat Superman would simply be to become a magic user because against them he becomes kind of powerless. When it comes to the explanation for why, a lot of people's theories surrounding this have to do with the fact that Superman's powers are naturally occurring, not magic based themselves. Although this is usually used as a means to weaken him in the comics as he doesn't have a natural means to defend against against magic, and it's one of the few things like kryptonite that his invulnerability does not protect him from. In fact, narratively speaking, this is likely why he was made weak to magic to begin with, to help give him more to struggle against as a character, as he's kinda OP usually. Number 8. Rogue Rogue was one of my favorite characters growing up, and I think what I loved about her so much was the tragedy of her story and her powers. But what's even more, I love the way that Rogue overcame them. Still, this would be 
be a terrible weakness to have or have had, so that's why I'm including Rogue on our list. Rogue's powers allow her to adopt the powers of whoever she comes into physical contact with, actually taking their powers for herself, basically draining them. But that's not all Rogue takes with her touch. She can also take your memories and drain your life force. Or at least, you know, she could do that. Rogue has since overcome this weakness by facing her fears. As it turns out, it was her own subconscious that was basically making it manifest. Number 7. Wonder Woman One of Wonder Woman's original weaknesses seems to be in line with what she represents as a character, female power and strength. As an Amazon, Wonder Woman was initially also susceptible to losing her strength and power if she was ever restrained by a man. While some might see this as kind of a sexist weakness in the comics, I would actually see it as kind of being the opposite. To me, it's more meant to symbolize a history of oppression against women and its consequences. At least, that's how I see that weakness. However, regardless of any greater meaning behind it, it was also a pretty silly weakness in the sense that it made Wonder Woman fairly easy to defeat under certain circumstances. And you know, if she was going up against men because if they just found her bracelets, that's kind of it. So I do have to say, I'm glad this is no longer a rule for her in the comics today. Number 6. Nightcrawler Well, Nightcrawler is a super powerful character overall and an iconic and amazing character as well. He isn't actually the most powerful teleporter. This has to do with his weird restrictions and weaknesses surrounding teleportation. The big one being that he can only teleport by a max distance of about, I believe, two miles at a time. Uh, the other main one being the more that he teleports, the more exhausted he gets. And Curtis, a teleporter, can tire fairly quickly if he's forced to make multiple jumps, which if he has to go far, he kind of has to do because each jump he can only go so far. Kurt does teleport through the brimstone dimension, which I saw some people in the comics bringing up as like a super powerful thing. But this is actually more how his teleportation skills work. It's not necessarily something he's choosing to do, as he has to travel through the brimstone dimension to get where he's going. So while yes, he can travel interdimensionally, it's only one dimension and it's not really by choice, it's more by design. However, Kurt is an amazing character because of his limitations. That's what makes him so great. It means that when Kurt has to push it to save the day, and he often of course does just that because he really is a hero, he's often putting his life on the line for ideals he believes in or for all of Earth or all of life itself, whatever he's defending. That's why we love Kurt. Number 5. Green Lantern Hal Jordan is Green Lantern, or one of the Green Lanterns anyways, and as a Green Lantern he has a pretty iconic and ridiculous weakness. Or at least for a very long time in the comics he did have that weakness. Hal had a weakness to the color yellow. In fact, all Green Lanterns did for a while. This was as a result of parallax existing within the Green Lantern Corps central battery. Having the entity of fear within the battery caused all Green Lanterns to develop a weakness to yellow, something that was used in All Star Batman and Robin and Frank Miller's alternate reality to weaken and torment Hal Jordan's Green Lantern. In the All Star Batman and Robin comic, Batman and Robin basically paint themselves and an entire safe house yellow, just to teach Hal a lesson about meddling in Batman's affairs. Number 4. Black Cat Black Cat is an anti-hero over at Marvel Comics, who is generally known for being an ally and sometimes romantic partner of Spider-Man. While she typically is shown as being a skilled thief with acrobatic skills and superb training and experience as a fighter, at least that's how she was depicted initially, she doesn't usually have any superpowers to speak of. However, at one point, she did just have straight up powers, and this happened for Black Cat when the Kingpin granted her wish of getting them. However, because this was the Kingpin, it of course did not work out exactly as Felicia had planned. She ended up with bad luck powers, which were extremely useful when fighting an enemy, but um, not so useful when with an ally or anyone else, as they actually affected not just her opponents, but like anyone who was close to her, which means that Peter suffered from them as well. To make matters worse, Felicia kept her powers a secret from him, which ended up driving a wedge between the two when it came to their romantic and working relationships with one another. Number 3. Green Lantern Alan Scott used to have a hilarious weakness, similar to someone else on our list actually. Let me know in the comments when and if you figure out who I'm talking about here. Alan Scott had a weakness to wood. The explanation for why and how this weakness developed was explained later by the fact that Alan was snuck up on and basically attacked using a wooden club sort of, and as a result he subconsciously manifested this as a weakness of his due to him mistaking it for one when in reality, you know, it just hurts to get smacked by a piece of wood because that just hurts. Thankfully Alan Scott has overcome this and this strange weakness that was actually originally tied to being the hero Green Lantern in the comics no longer bothers Alan or any other Green Lanterns for that matter. Number 2. Iska the Unbeaten Iska is a super interesting character. On one hand she is extremely powerful and 
can never lose. She can even potentially have her power utilized to manipulate the stakes of other competitions that she's pulled into. However, this also implies that there are times when she has zero control over her powers in the sense that she cannot influence the result of an unbalanced battle. In fact, her powers will pull her to serve the side that will be victorious, regardless of whether or not she wants to in terms of what her mind or her heart is saying to her. This has meant that Iska has been forced to turn her back on her own people, the mutants of Arako, more than once. She has also had to fight against family, colleagues, and friends before as a result. Although the one thing she can control at times is kind of how she approaches the fighting part of, you know, the battle. Meaning that if she has the option, you know, she can try to fight others involved as opposed to those that she is specifically close to. Like during her fight against planet Araco and the Great Ring when she was teleported away to the planet's ocean by Nightcrawler and chose to stay there fighting the planet's creatures in the name of Uranus and the Eternals as opposed to fighting her own people directly or continuing to fight them directly. Number 1, Power Girl. Power Girl probably has one of the weirdest weaknesses around. Despite being a Kryptonian who is on the level of Superman when it comes to her powers and her strength, she can easily be harmed simply if you use organic materials to hurt her. You know that saying about sticks and stones which may break your bones? Well, for Power Girl, despite having super durability and invulnerability, this is true. Sticks and stones could break her bones, but industrial steel probably wouldn't hurt her for some reason. Raw organic materials which have been unprocessed are revealed to be a weakness of Power Girl's in Supergirl issue number 16 from the 1996 series. Power Girl shares this revelation with her alternate self from the main continuity at the time, who was shocked by the revelation. Which, I mean, fair enough. I would be too if I were Linda Danvers, who was Supergirl at that time. However, I will say I don't think that Kara has this weakness anymore in the comics, thank goodness. But in the 90s, it was a thing, and it was there for some reason. That Kicking off the list at number 10, Adamantium and Vibranium. Perhaps one of the greatest superheroes to go toe to toe with the Incredible Hulk is Wolverine. Especially in the Old Man Logan storyline, we find the Hulk as one of the few remaining superheroes on Earth. Now this is when the Hulk had a little Hulk gang running around, they were actually responsible for the death of Wolverine's family. So when Wolverine came around to fight it out with the Hulk, he just straight up swallowed him. That's the thing about being a beast like this, you can literally just eat your problems away. But thanks to Wolverine's claws, he's able to easily tear his way out. See Wolverine, X-23, and the Black Panther are all able to pierce the Hulk's skin. We can see this take place in World War Hulk X-Men. Number nine, toxins. In The Incredible Hulk Volume 2, Issue 110, we catch up with Banner after the spaceship that took him to Sakaar blew up. This explosion took out many of his new otherworldly friends, including his new queen. So now he came back to Earth ready to dish out revenge, but thankfully Scorpion, Carmilla Black, injected him with a toxin that counteracts the Hulk's healing factor. Her arm is packed with a cocktail of new toxins designed by S.H.I.E.L.D. to goof up his gamma-powered physiology. Number 8, Rage Nullification. See, part of the problem lies in the solution sometimes. In the MCU, we see Natasha able to bring Banner back after the green guy has punched the enemies out of existence. All she has to do is rub his hands and say the sun is getting real low and voila, now we have Bruce Banner back. In the comics, this is also a weakness. When that rage gets neutralized, Banner is extremely vulnerable, seeing as he's now just a scientist at that point. Betty Ross can also calm down the Hulk, and she does so in issue 141 of The Incredible Hulk. And Sentry as well was able to calm him in Century Hulk issue one. Telepaths have also been known to be able to do this as well. They just need empathy potential and they can emulate this effect. The inhuman Randall Jessup has the ability to cast out negative emotions, so he can come into play here as well. Number seven, magic users. In Avengers Age of Ultron, when Wanda Maximoff was introduced first as a villain, she played mind games with the entire team. In Wakanda, her and her brother met up with Ultron and when the team arrives to stop the vibranium deal, Wanda then uses her magic to weaken the team. She of course gets Banner and he hulks out. Out, big time. Now at this point in the MCU, like I mentioned, Black Widow was the only key to bringing Banner back out of the green guy. All she has to do is stroke his palm, tell him how the sun's getting low and Bruce is back naked and afraid. But this time Natasha was under some spells herself. She was too busy reliving her dark past while the Hulk just exploded and broke Johannesburg. It took Iron Man and his new Veronica Hulkbuster armor to come and knock some sense into him, or rather knock some sense out of him. 
Number six, enchanted weapons. While Wanda and her magic hands sure do a number on Bruce, enchanted weapons are also effective. We see this in Defenders issue one. Now at first the Hulk thinks that he's above enchanted beings. He's like waving hands, glowing fingers, those are all stupid things. The Hulk can smash, I mean who needs magic anyways? So his plan was to just smash and smash because he never gets tired. Then in comes Strange and he wraps the Hulk in the crimson bands of Sidorak, all the while the Hulk is begging to be let free. He just wants to destroy something. He's boasting the entire time about how he never gets tired and just wants something to hit, something the same size as him. And then when Necrodomus enters the fight wielding an enchanted blade, well, the Hulk sure feels that one. Number five, his lack of patience. One of the most intimidating factors of the Incredible Hulk is that he will punch first and ask questions later. It's great, except for when a plan is needed. He doesn't believe anybody is more powerful than him, so he lacks this concern in combat. He's overconfident that he'll win, and in Marvel Team Up issue 13, we see him run into the battle to take on the scroll Titanus without even consulting the team. And of course, this is the reason he's the first to go down. Even in Avengers Infinity War, he surprises Thanos by jumping out at him but the element of surprise isn't the only trick, it's not the key here. You can't just jump out, scream, and then start punching people all the time. Some of the time, definitely. But all the time, no way. Thanos punched him so hard he retired. Perhaps patience and better timing could have sufficed. Number four, gamma radiation. Halloween was always awesome growing up. I would eat the candy while I was collecting the candy. I was just giving myself more and more energy to collect. And I did good too. But too much candy and now you're sweating. Now you feel sick, you're done for the night. Just the sight of a Kit Kat makes you want to... Mm. Too much of a good thing sure can hinder your night. Same goes with the Hulk when it comes to gamma radiation. Sure, it's the exact thing that powers him up so he's able to throw statues at his co-workers, but too much gamma radiation and it's bad news. Like in the future in Perfect Storyline, for example, Professor Hulk travels to a dark future where he crosses paths with, well, himself, future stronger version of himself, the Maestro. The Hulk could not beat this guy, no chance. So instead, he tricked the Maestro and got him to time travel back to the past where that first gamma bomb went off, the same bomb that created the Hulk in the first place. So when the bomb goes off, now there's too much gamma in the mix and this results in the passing of the Maestro. Too much gamma, too many Kit Kats, tomatoes, tomatoes. Number three, the power cosmic. The Silver Surfer is a big name on the list of the Hulk's weaknesses because the Silver Surfer possesses the power cosmic, which was given to him by Galactus himself. So now he has the ability to absorb and tap into ambient cosmic energy and channel it throughout his body. And at this point, he can take out planets if he feels like it. And the Hulk is not a planet. And most of the time he and the Silver Surfer cross paths, it usually ends up with the Silver Surfer coming out on top. Some powers you can't just punch away, you know? Number two, the puppy bomb. Okay, whatever you're imagining in your head, as soon as I said the puppy bomb, it's much nicer than that. It's not a bomb full of puppies. We're not just gonna launch golden retrievers at Bruce Banner in hopes that it helps, I don't know. But we are launching cute puppies. That's something we are doing. In Indestructible Hulk issue one, S.H.I.E.L.D. pulls out all the stops to calm down the big guy. And I mean, all the stops. Yeah, they just launch a bunch of puppies at him and he goes from ah to uh. I mean, I mean that ought to do a trick. If I saw one puppy, I'd be like, Okay, but if I saw like a bunch of puppies, I'd be like, okay. And number one, Bruce Banner. Other Hulks are able to contain their anger issues while growing into the green monster. She-Hulk is calm and cool and collect. She's got a hand on the wheel. Amadeus Cho, same idea. He's able to keep the angries out as long as he eats food. He keeps the brain going rather than the muscles, you know? But the Incredible Hulk is different, unfortunately. See, Bruce's childhood has something to do with it. His father was awful to him, really awful. He got mad at Bruce because of his high intellect. He ended up going to prison for taking out his mother, so Bruce already had a lot of pain inside him, even as a young kid before Gamma stuff. The ghost of his father constantly haunted him, and when the Hulk comes out and takes over Banner, those early childhood memories are the fuel behind the fists. It's part of what makes the Hulk story so unique, that Banner has to fight this dark version of himself while also being a superhero. Number 10, Hope Summers. Hope is one of those mutants who has become problematic for writers because she is just so powerful. She can adopt any other mutant's powers, and there is no limit to how many power sets she can use at once. She doesn't drain the powers from them, like Rogue, simply mimics them, but she also gains the peak performance level of their powers as well. And she doesn't have to touch someone to use their abilities, so that's a plus side to one of her weaknesses, I guess. So how do we cap someone like that? How do we make her writable and relatable? Well, usually we make her feel conflicted and want to run away. We've all wanted to run away at some point, right? But for weaknesses, they could have made it a certain ability, a certain power that she just can't use and can drastically cause her harm as a result or something like that. But nope, she's the mutant messiah after all, so instead her weakness is distance. 
and time to an extent. So in other words, the easiest way to defeat Hope is just run away from her. If she can't get to you and you have enough distance between you and her, then she can't really mimic your abilities. And really, distance is her only main weakness. Well, unless she gets her hands on a teleporter's abilities, because then she'd have to teleport away from the teleporter. And if she teleports too far away from them, how could she use their abilities? Wait a minute. I feel like this is a weakness that wasn't fully thought through. How did she use teleportation abilities? Did she have to take teleporter with her? What? Number nine, Wolverine. Logan is definitely one of the most popular mutants, if not the most popular, and known for being one of the coolest and toughest mutants out there. So what's he doing on this list? Well, not everything about him is as cool as you think, but one thing especially, that is his weakness to magnets. Now, granted, this makes sense. His adamantium skeleton is one of his greatest strengths, although likely it can be his greatest weakness in a way, as in old age it kind of poisons him. But beyond that, it also becomes a weakness when he comes up against anyone with magnetic powers. Namely, you guessed it, Magneto. Magneto actually once used his power to rip the adamantium out of Wolverine. Ouch. Actually, I feel like he maybe has done this more than once in the comics, proving just how deadly this weakness can be for Logan. While it's no joke, and it does make sense, it just sounds ridiculous. And it makes me think of Wolverine falling to his knees if we were just to cover him in fridge magnets. And I know we'd likely need something stronger than fridge magnets to cause him harm, but still, this imagery is pretty hysterical to me. So if you think of Wolverine's weakness to magnets, it makes sense, but it just sounds ridiculous on paper. Weaknesses, magnets. <laughs> Number eight, Nate Gray. Nate Gray might be insanely powerful and be able to do pretty much anything, but there is one guy who can cause him some serious harm. That's his kind of alternate version of himself slash weird multiverse half-brother, Cable, Nathan Summers. Because these two share such an identical size signature, being in one another's presence actually severely messes with both of them. It causes their powers to go slightly haywire, forcing them to randomly share memories with one another, and even causes them visible pain. This is an especially odd weakness, considering that this doesn't really happen with any of the other alternates, or any of their other alternates, including Cable's evil clone, Strife. Think if it's gonna happen with Nate Gray, shouldn't it happen with Strife? Nor does it seem to be a common occurrence among any other alternates in the Marvel Universe. So, very strange. Number seven, magic. Magic's main weakness is her own emotions. She is capable of both good magic and dark magic. And when she feels intense emotions, if she gives into it, it can actually turn her dark, transforming her into her dark child persona, a sort of demonic and somewhat evil version of herself. So she's got similar problems to DC's Raven of having to be careful about how strongly she feels about something. Having to not feel emotions as intensely for fear of what you do is about as serious as it is ridiculous. These weaknesses in comics seem to be given to the most powerful characters because how else do you make them relatable and at least somehow defeatable? I mean, when magic actually has all of her magical abilities, she's pretty OP. Number six, Kitty Pride, or Captain Kate as she's going by now, has a weird weakness in the sense that her powers are kind of her, also her weakness. Okay, okay, hear me out. So for one, she used to have the restriction and still sometimes does, I think, depending on who is writing her, that she has to hold her breath while phasing. Now, fortunately, this has pretty much been changed because her powers have increased and it was really pretty silly. Like, she has to hold her breath, yet she does all of these things. Doesn't really make a lot of sense. In fact, I think it was such a silly restriction on her powers that Marvel realized, oh, we should maybe change this. But beyond that, as useful as her powers are, they have also gotten her into trouble. So they're both a pro and a con in a way. Like when she managed to phase into that giant bullet, but found herself unable to phase back out due to the material that the bullet was made of and how thick it was. And yet that material that prevented her from phasing out did not prevent her from phasing into the bullet and phasing her and the entire bullet through the planet Earth. So what is up with that? Also, was that bullet made out of adamantium? Because I couldn't find anything about that, but I know that Kitty Pride has an issue with adamantium. So I'm just wondering, if anyone knows, let me know. Number five, Cyclops. While Scott is trained to have great control over his powers, he's nothing without his visor, or his more casual sunglasses if we're talking about the film starring James Marsden as Cyclops. 
Ruby Quartz lenses or long single lens helps Scott to see without having to worry about shooting everyone up with his optic blasts. While his combat visor also allows him to direct his optic blasts in more specific ways, controlled by a ton of buttons that are in his gloves that allow him to change the mirrors and the screen in his visor so that he can manage all kinds of masterful targeting when it comes to taking down enemies. But if he loses his glasses or his visor, he actually can't see because he has to keep his eyes closed and his powers become more of a hazard than an asset. This has rendered him useless before in battle and made him terrified to harm those he loves, his fellow X-Men and his longtime love, Jean Grey. I've also wondered if him seeing red means you could use this to your advantage when fighting Cyclops and find a way to sneak up on him, like if you had really good red camouflage made. So like you could, he wouldn't see you. He'd be like, all I see is red. Where's that person? Number four, Rogue. Rogue's main weakness is actually herself. Later on in her story, we learn that it is actually Rogue's own fear that holds her back. Her abilities could be controlled if she simply wasn't so afraid of them. Her first kiss with Cody Robbins, which left him in a coma, ended up being the event that created this fear in her and allowed her to believe that she was dangerous for the rest of her life. And as such, she became dangerous. Some self-actualization stuff going on in her story. But once she overcomes this fear, she is actually granted more control over her powers. Now, while I love this story and journey for her, especially because it's kind of relatable if you're the type of person to self-doubt, the revelation of this weakness also changed changes her character a lot. For a lot of people, the struggle of being so powerful yet so dangerous is what people really love about Rogue. How she is tormented by the fact that she is basically forced to live a life of full-on social distancing 24-7. So for it to have all been in her head, it feels a little bit like a cop-out. Years of torment could have apparently been avoided if Rogue had just believed in herself more. Number three, Iceman. Bobby is actually one of the most powerful mutants in the Marvelverse, and yet people might not always think of him when it comes to some of the most powerful mutants around. This is because what often holds Robert Drake back is his own imagination. Iceman has actually been capable of accomplishing insane feats with his powers, and may have been capable of that the entire time. He can create sentient ice golems and change not only his own form from ice to water, but he can also do that to others as well. What has prevented him from this? Well, his lack of imagination that he could do it. This fact also makes me wonder if this is true for other mutants apart from Bobby. Like, could all mutants just be a lot stronger if they were just more creative? or in Rogue's case, if they believed in themselves more? Do they need to train less at Xavier's school and simply just take more elective arts courses and expand their minds? Or maybe some more therapy courses, deal with their stuff. Number two, Gambit. Remy LeBeau often seems to be considered an underrated X-Men. He can create massive explosions using kinetic energy, which he focuses on an object that is charged by his touch and then explodes. He also has great control over his powers. He can charge something with kinetic energy and actually time that explosion. But there are two things that you might have noticed in the comics when it comes to his character. He never seems to charge people or any other organic life forms. So what's up with that? For many, they might just think that Gambit actually chooses not to because, you know, he's a good guy. But it has been debated in the comics that this idea of charging living matter might not even be an option for Gambit. So he can charge anything basically non-living, but nothing that is alive. This is also a weakness that sometimes seems to be forgotten by writers, as it's not been completely consistent or fully explained. So sometimes he can do it, which is weird. And despite the amazing control that he exhibits, this was actually something granted to him by Mr. Sinister. Gambit actually made a deal with Sinister to operate on his brain in order to help him control his powers more, while also kind of limiting them so he doesn't basically go haywire and kill everyone he loves. The results of the surgery were both, of course, a strength and a weakness, as they granted Gambit more control while also limiting his powers somewhat. Also, making deals with Mr. Sinister is just usually ill-advised. The fact that that even happened in a comic with Gambit? Strange. Number one, Mastermind. Mastermind can create powerful illusions, ones that feel, smell, sound, taste, and look completely real. For example, if he creates a wall, it will feel like a wall, it'll smell like a wall, it'll taste like a wall. But if you can overcome how convincing this illusion seems, if you can just decide to run through that wall, you'll realize it isn't actually there. And his illusions can only exist as long as you believe them to be true. They require you to believe. So once you shatter one of his illusions, all the others will just come tumbling down after. Jason Wingard also has to concentrate for you to be able to see his illusion. So many people 
people have taken him out in battle simply by distracting him momentarily. He also cannot control who sees his illusions and who doesn't. For example, if he creates a giant butterfly in a room, all who are in the room with it will see it. Anyone who has it within their line of sight will see it. In fact, you could say his weaknesses appear greater than his strengths in a lot of ways. Kind of a weird villain like that. Also, sometimes he's super powerful, sometimes he's not that powerful at all. Number 10, Identity Crisis. When She-Hulk was stuck in her Hulk form, she originally thought it was due to being overexposed to radiation, but later found that this was not the case, and that her issue was more psychological. Truly, many of She-Hulk's battles have come from within when it comes to her feelings and her overall persona while in her Hulk-like form. For a while, she was even forced to view her feelings towards her obsession with being the She-Hulk as though she was addicted. And I mean, she kind kind of was. She takes a lot of pride from being She-Hulk, but it also tends to poison her view of herself when she is not in this form, and is just plain old Jennifer Walters. While this might not be an obvious weakness in battle, Jennifer's emotions can affect her transformation and amount of control she has over her Hulk form, so it kind of is a weakness in battle. <laughs> Sometimes. It's also just like a weakness when you're not in battle. You're like, ugh, who am I? Number nine, writers. She Hulk has had some of the best writers involved in her comics over the years, with probably one of the most iconic being John Byrne. But while readers of the sensational She Hulk would praise Byrne's work during his run, Jennifer Walters herself would beg to differ with our opinions. She Hulk is famous for breaking the fourth wall, making it cool before even Deadpool after he was introduced in the comics in 1991. She Hulk herself made her comic book debut in 1980. Jennifer would use this trope to complain about all of the terrible writing that was happening within her comics, how she was displeased with the way she was being portrayed, and would often call out tired comic book tropes that were constantly being repeated within the comic book world of storytelling. As She-Hulk saw it, John Byrne was one of the worst things to happen to her, and him writing this made him one of the best. Unfortunately, She-Hulk never came around to our point of view though, comically going so far as to kill Byrne as his run in the series came to an end in issue 50. Uh, splat. <laughs> So funny, right on the sidewalk. Number eight, her cousin. That's right, we're gonna talk about Bruce Banner. I know what you're thinking, but they have such a great relationship. What are you talking about, Amanda? Well, Jennifer Walters may love Bruce. It is sometimes her love of Bruce that ends up being her downfall in a fight. Jen is one of the few people that can talk Bruce down. And while this mostly works in the comics, sometimes it just results in her being badly beaten. Of course, She-Hulk is so strong that she can kind of just take a beating, but also being beaten to near death by the one that you love seems like like a, a bad play all around. In World War Hulk, She-Hulk was expected to be the one who might be able to reach Bruce while he was threatening the lives of the heroes responsible for sending him away, and he thought responsible for killing his beloved Kara. However, this just resulted in her getting beaten to a pulp as Hulk was too far gone for her to bring Bruce back. So while her bond to Bruce can sometimes be a strength, it can also end up leaving She-Hulk weaker than when she started when it comes to being healthy and battle ready. She was like, come on, just like maybe don't be Hulk right now, and he was like, you're making me even more or angry. Number seven, sadness. Feels so weird to say this is a weakness. When Jennifer Walters wakes up after the events of the Second Civil War, she discovers that Bruce is gone, that he was deemed too great of a threat, and taken out by one of Hawkeye's arrows. She mourns him. This fresh loss and the stress that comes with it causes her transformations to become uncontrollable. They are now tied to her grief, and when she gets swept up in thoughts of her cousin, she transforms. But she is no longer the green, fun-loving She-Hulk we once knew, but a less intellectual, gray She-Hulk, a mom monstrous looking creature. She is able to use this form to her advantage, but changing has become a place of pain for Jen, causing her to often avoid super heroics and only transform to work on beating her own internal monsters and occasionally to help those close to her or simply to defend herself or to smash things. Taking it out, anger. Take that grief out in anger. It's all right though, she is her friend Hellcat. Number six. Blood disease. When Jennifer contracted a blood disease, it appeared as if she might die. She ended up having to turn to the famous Spider Man villain, turned sometimes hero, Morbius the Living Vampire, to have it cured. Michael Morbius, being a famous hematologist, was able to cure Jennifer and save her life. And in fact, during the process, she also gained the ability to control her transformations. Later, she repaid Morbius' help with this deadly weakness when she represented him in court. She Hulk is actually known for being otherwise immune to contracting most types of diseases or ailments, but her blood seems to be kind of a weak spot for her, perhaps because it is 
the source of her power. Number 5. Rage For most Hulks, rage is a key ingredient, as Bruce Banner has famously warned us before when he says, you wouldn't like me when I'm angry. For She-Hulk, this famously tends to not be an issue, well, except for when it is. Whenever She-Hulk's radiation levels are askew, it creates an imbalance which can result in her going into a rage as a result of her transformation. Rage is a dangerous emotion for Jennifer because it puts blinders on her and often makes her unaware of her actions. She has ripped Vision in half, attacked her teammates, and destroyed an entire town as a result of being forced to give in to her rage. Rage for her equals bad. It's not a good correlation like Bruce Banner. Number 4. Red Hulks While She Hulk may be strong, the best way to take her down in a fight is by simply being stronger than her. And both Red Hulk and Red She Hulk have proven they're capable of just that. Red Hulk seem to tap into that lack of control and wild abandon of rage more freely than their green counterparts. At one point, Betty Ross's Red She Hulk, who was in full rage mode, even ended up killing She Hulk. Well, at least we thought she did. She choked her and left her for dead. It turned out that She Hulk was actually in stasis, and so she never really died. It just looked like she had died. Ha ha ha, comic book trickery. She Hulk also would later kick Red She Hulk's butt, so fortunately, Red She Hulk would not remain a weakness for Jennifer forever. So the Red Hulks have given She Hulk a fairly hard time before. So, how do you beat a Hulk? Usually with another Hulk. Or maybe a Hulkbuster. Biggest weakness, people that can punch harder than her. 3. Nanites For a while in the comics, Jennifer Walters was depowered as a result of being injected with spin tech. Tony Stark had her depowered, fearing that she would try to interfere after discovering the plot behind her cousin's disappearance. Fair enough, she probably would have. Stuck in her human form, Jennifer Walters was reduced to the strength of an average human. Well, an average human who lifts, presumably. As She Hulk becomes stronger from training, meaning Jennifer herself is actually quite a gym enthusiast. Her strength equals She Hulk's strength, so. And no longer having access to her powers, she did the only thing she could think of took legal action against Stark. In the end, her powers were returned to her after running into an alternate version of herself whose Earth didn't have superpowers but who gained powers after being transported to Earth 616. It's a long story. Moving through the same transporter device granted She Hulk her powers again, resetting her and curing her of the unwanted spin tech. Get that out of here. Whew. Shouldn't have to go live on a depowered Earth. Be awkward. Number two, fear. For a while, fear becomes She Hulk's trigger, meaning that whenever she gets afraid, it causes her to change. This has been a recurring issue for Jen and a weakness in terms of her actually being able to keep control over herself and not lash out at her teammates. When we're talking about Hulks, a lot of the weaknesses we're really talking about here are a lack of control. Typical werewolf type story or Jekyll and Hyde story. Scarlet Witch's influence caused her to rage and caused her to almost kill Captain America and tear Vision in half. Not truly the real Vision, but of course, She Hulk did not know that at the time. Afraid of what she was capable of, She-Hulk went into hiding. But during the search for She-Hulk storyline, her greatest fears become reality as we see her lose control again and destroy the entire town of Bone, Idaho. Poor Bone, Idaho. Number 1. Radiation Wait, doesn't radiation give her strength though? Well, it does, but that doesn't mean that it can't mess her up. Her increased exposure to radiation in a shield helicarrier was thought to be the cause of her being unable to shift back into her human form. It was later revealed that this wasn't really the case, but then later on, after being exposed to the radioactive Jack of Hearts, she began to lose control of her cool. She became more like her cousin, rage fueled and uncontrollable. One of the best things about She Hulk normally that makes her so powerful is her ability to remain level headed while hulked out and losing this ability turned her into a less useful and more dangerous loose cannon. So basically, radiation can power her up, but too much can also turn her berserk. So it's like a strength and a weakness. What? In at number 10, Sensitive Senses. There are a fistful of characters whose powers include some sort of enhanced sense or senses, such as the case with Marvel's Daredevil, a man whose lack of vision doesn't stop him from being a fantastic hero. His accident, while responsible for the loss of his eyes, enhanced his other senses. Now This includes echolocation, an ability in which Matt Murdock can partially see thanks to his hearing acting like a powerful radar, kind of like a bat. But because of this, he's sensitive to loud noises, and in the past we've seen high decibel sounds mess him up. For example, in Daredevil Volume 2, West Case Scenario, Purple Man uses ultra Ultrasound to leave Matt in an excruciating amount of pain. Now, this weakness goes beyond enhanced senses. Villains don't target extrasensory abilities nearly that much either, and you'd think that a foe would use that information of a hero's power and then find a way to overwhelm their minds. Instead, we more frequently see characters who have an invulnerability to psychic attacks being more of a threat to those who use telepathy or telekinesis. 
And at number nine, no peripheral vision. This one kind of seems like a given, but I personally cannot think of a single comic in which I've seen this go down. Also, feel free to comment in those comments below and inform me. So, have you seen some of the cowls and helmets on these heroes? It's like wearing horse blinders on your head. The lack of peripheral vision should be a major issue in the superhero community, but we never really see or hear about it, do we? It would be easy to sneak up on some heroes and, being in their blind spot, attack them. Now, obviously, that wouldn't happen with a hero like Batman, who's just like prepared for everything and can probably see out of the back of his head, but that being said, not everyone is Batman. <laughs> it's also surprising that more heroes don't suffer from tunnel vision either. A self imposed tunnel vision, that is. And at number eight, unprotected faces. Here's one that we really, really adore. So, say you're a superhero. You have superpowers and you want to put them to good use. So, you whip up a costume and begin a career as a vigilante in your hometown. But a few neighborhood patrols in, you find yourself face to face with an armed criminal. He manages to catch you off guard and points a gun right at you. And bam! shoots you right in the face, specifically where your mouth is, because like many other superheroes, you wear a cowl or a helmet that covers the top of your head and your eyes and the sides, but is lacking in the lower half of your face, leaving that area exposed. Now imagine if someone got close enough to Batman and stuck a gun right into his jaw and shot him point blank. Bruce Wayne can survive a lot, but a bullet to the brain, still pretty questionable. Although I feel like he would somehow be so prepared that he would know that was gonna happen, so maybe Bruce Wayne isn't the best example to use there. In at seven, open spaces. Imagine this. You're Peter Parker. You're chasing after a villain who's committed a slew of crimes and put innocent lives in danger. While tracking them down, your investigation takes you to a big, wide open area, like a rural field or some other vacant land with relatively flat ground. And that is when you get jumped. But guess what? There's nothing to shoot off your webs and swing around from. Sure, you can jump and be acrobatic and whatnot, but if there's one thing that Marvel's PS4 Spider Man video game has taught us, it's that Spidey dominates when he's up in the air. And it is much easier to get hurt or shot at when you're on the ground. Open areas also provide a lack of cover, which may not help out other heroes who lack the invulnerability that others have in their skill sets. All in all, city's good. Big open desert spaces, probably very bad. Unless you've got like a camouflage ability, in which case this list is not for you. Moving on to something very ridiculous, but also fairly accurate, in at six, AK 47s. Or just guns in general. Okay, yes, this is a rather dark number, but you know it's true. While some heroes would be exempt from this harming them, like Superman, for example, definitely could withstand a barrage of bullets, others who do not have that invulnerability would be majorly susceptible to gun wounds. We recently saw in Heroes in Crisis how devastating a mass shooting in the superhero world could be. It was a reminder that superheroes are not as invulnerable as we assume them to be, especially if their guard is down or they are hit multiple times. Riffing off of our last number in something equally as dark and kind of preposterous to think about in comics, in at number five, gun laws. Now, a supervillain could use the lenient gun laws in the US to their advantage. Say that they wanted to gun down a hero and get away with it. Just lure them onto your own property and then fire away and then claim it was self defense. I know, like I said, this is actually a very dark number because it happens in real life, but not with heroes, with regular people. Now, we won't be surprised to see something like that legally work out in favor of our hypothetical villain here. Although, that is kind of just strictly the US. That smug trick would not work in Canada or a lot of other countries in the world. And at number four, time management. Superheroes have lives too, you guys. And if there is one thing we've learned from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, it's hard to strive for a life of normalcy when you've got to kick evil's butt. Often heroes are forced to choose between regular life stuff and saving lives, the latter being a quite demanding responsibility. I mean, Superman even quit once upon a time because of this. And I mean, he almost immediately returned to being a hero when he realized that Metropolis was kind of screwed without him. But still, if a villain really wanted to grind a hero down and have the patience to do so, they could learn about their hero's schedule, figure out their secret identity of course, and then plan a series of attacks at times that would be really inconvenient for their foe. Just hack their iCloud and take a look at their calendar. And then wait for their life to gradually fall apart and affect their superheroing. Wait till they're already vulnerable and then strike when they're most stressed, distracted, and foggy minded. It's a little manipulative, sure, but I mean as far as some villains are concerned, whatever gets the job done, right? Moving on to number three, low confidence. Captain Britain, Gladiator, and Zatanna all share this weakness. Low confidence, especially in the superhero community, is one that can really punch you in the gut and lead to dire consequences. Generally, when this is a weakness of a superhero's, the more confidence they have, the better they are in combat. And then the opposite, the less confidence they have, the worse they are in combat. While some villains have taken advantage of this over the years, you would think that demoralizing and humiliating superheroes would be way more of a trend in the criminal community since it's proven so effective on some other heroes. Just saying. I mean, I feel like that's a low though. 
just go around on the superhero social media accounts and bully them online as some anonymous troll. Just make them feel terrible about themselves. And then they get out there and they're like, everyone hates me. And then they get beaten up by a villain. It's just it's a hard life for a hero. You gotta have tough skin. Moving on to number two, identity reveal. Now you'd think with the number of villains who have discovered superheroes' identities over the years, there would be a lot more whistleblowing in comics. Case in point, the Joker. When he knew Batman's true identity to be Bruce Wayne, he covered for the Cape Crusader and didn't tell anyone. Partially because, you know, he was obsessed with him and wanted to get him himself, but you know, it's a fun individual. Quite literally. Now this is partially because the Joker is insane and utterly obsessed with Batman, therefore does not want anyone else to finish him off. But what excuses do other villains have? Revealing a superhero's identity or trying to rip off their masks in battle to expose them to the public would have a drastic effect on the character. It would ruin their private life, put them and all of their loved ones at risk constantly, and make it next to impossible to retain any sort of normalcy in their lives. A revealed identity though has helped some heroes rather than hindered them in the past. The likes of Ozymandias for example, who used his famous to build an empire, or the great machine in Brian K. Vaughn's Ex Machina, who revealed his own identity to benefit his turn to politics. But generally, we think it may hinder more than help in many cases, so it's surprising that more villains don't use it as a common tactic to get what they want. Although there are quite a few who have done that in the past. And last but not least, in at number one, wardrobe malfunction. And no, we are not talking the likes of Janet Jackson and Justin Timberlake, friends, and that is a bit of an aged reference, so if you know it, it just makes me feel old. <laughs> when you think of death by cape, you often think of one of two famous instances. The first is Doctor Strange being strangled by his cloak in Marvel's Ultimatum. The second is Dollar Bill, one of the vigilantes on the Minutemen team in the 30s and 40s from Watchmen. The latter got his cape stuck in a revolving door, and a smart criminal used that opportunity to shoot him point blank. When you consider how effective using a hero's wardrobe against them could be, it's almost surprising that there aren't more villains trying to grab hold of heroes' capes to yank them close, strangle them, or put them in some sort of precarious position. Number 9. Red Sun Radiation While our sun can certainly recharge the Man of Steel back into punch mode, Red Sun Radiation can do the opposite of heal. It can damage Kryptonians because it gives off more radiation. So in Superman War of the Supermen, we see a Red Sun instantly start to weaken and suffocate Superman and Supergirl. It's because Red Sun Radiation replaces the yellow solar energy in Superman's cells, eliminating his powers. Red Sunlight was actually the main source of of solar energy near Krypton, but Clark spent so much time around our sun on this planet that it clearly works better for him. Except for his mustache, uh, whenever it comes to that, it doesn't really seem like anything works with that upper lip problem that we have. Number eight, high pitched noises. You ever accidentally scrape your fork against the plate and that high pitched squeal that comes from it makes your spine wanna like pop out the back of your neck? God, it's the worst. My sister almost kills me every time I scrape just a tiny thing, I swear to God. Well, even Superman gets weak when he hears high-pitched noises like that as well. Now, of course, they're much louder than just a fork. See, his super hearing makes Black Canary and Silver Banshee a nightmare for him, because they can get pretty loud. So Batman tries this out against Clark in Batman vs Superman as well, and for a moment or two, it actually works on holding him back. Check it out. Lex wants a So maybe if Bruce had the world's biggest dog whistle, he could mess him up. Or that cowboy guy that sings like really high pitched in the mountains. I'm sure if he belted, Clark would definitely explode, perhaps. Number seven, magic. Superman can probably take a thousand bolts to the body and then walk away like it's no problem. But the magician David Blaine, eh, you never know. He could be pretty threatening to a Kryptonian. That's right, magic can indeed hurt Superman. His biomatrix is a powerful asset, but the strength in it can be used against him, specifically in the form of radiation that's found in magical energies. Electromagnetic or extra dimensional signatures disrupt his force field, weakening him, of course. Now, it depends what kind of magic is being used and how much of it is being shot out at him, but magic in general has unpredictable effects on him, and his magical enemies have often been the ones that are the most dangerous or come out on top, at least for a little bit. Number six, the Black Tide. In Action Comics issue 788, Superman is in a world where the air is filled with fire and a force called the Black Tide, this mysterious force causes Superman's chai flow to be disrupted. So he suffers in fatigue and pain until he gets a nice acupuncture appointment. Yeah, in the very next issue, we see Clark getting back on his feet with a few well-placed needles. 
He even asks if they're the world's strongest needles, and she's like, nope, they're just in the right spots. So, acupuncture, it's the only remedy that realigns his spirit, who knew? Number five, love. Yeah, of course, I said it. When it comes to weaknesses, some would say that it's just the thing you love most used against you. Now, this of course has come to light in many comics, movies, TV shows. It's not necessarily new, the whole damsel in distress thing. Of course it's gonna work. Where in order to keep Superman to bend at your will, you just gotta get Lois Lane or Martha in your custody, and then you can get Superman to go and fist fight Batman. It's the best. And then we watch the movies eating popcorn. We're like, yes, keep fighting. In Batman vs Superman, we see Barry Allen pop in from the Speed Force to let Bruce know that Lois Lane is the key. What key? What was he talking about? Well, that plus the nightmare sequence, it was apparent in that film that she was the key in preventing the Man of Steel from going evil and causing this world to look like chaos. Their love is keeping Kal-El from going nuts. Number four, lead. Superman is the best at playing hide and seek. He can see through walls. So no matter where you're hiding, odds are he's already found you if he's looking for you. But if you were to hide behind a lead wall, you just may win that game of hide and seek against a Kryptonian. How crazy is that? He has vision that matches the properties of x-ray. They call it x-ray vision. But the thing is, X-rays don't work with lead. That's why when you get an X-ray done at the dentist, they slap that bulletproof vest on you, then they like plug their ears and run out of the room. It's because that's lead. That's a no-go in the hashtag X-ray life. So it can actually help Superman out a bit though. See, as lead can block out kryptonite radiation. So it's, you know, it can kind of help Superman, but it can also be used against him. Superman's got a real love-hate relationship with pencils, it seems. <laughs> Pencils. Number three, Muhammad Ali. I have to include this because it's too amazing not to mention. Okay, so earlier in this list, I talked about how red sun energy can weaken a Kryptonian. So even though Superman is weak now, he's still probably at least a really strong dude, right? Well, there was once one comic book issue where a weakened Superman legit had to fight Muhammad Ali, and it was more intense than Mayweather vs. McGregor, at least in my opinion. Definitely yours too. See, this one shot made its debut back in 1970. 78, written by Dennis O'Neill and Neil Adams. And it featured the Man of Steel and of course, Muhammad Ali. And it was part of the all new collector's edition where this alien named Ratlar, who's part of a species known as the Scrub, they visit Earth. And they demand that we pick our best fighter to go against theirs. Now of course, there's being a behemoth named Hunya, so Hmm, yikes. Now, if we refuse, well, the scrub will then destroy the planet. So Muhammad Ali argues that since Superman isn't technically from Earth, Muhammad Ali must be the one who fights, which is so amusing for us. We're like, yes, thank God, do it. So Ratlar is amused by this, and he wants to know who is better of the two. So he pins the two champs up against each other, and the fight is set to take place on Bodes, which is orbiting a red star. So no more crazy powers for Superman, just old fisticuffs. And Muhammad Ali drops the man of steel. I would say I'm surprised, but Ali is literally the greatest, so not too surprised here. Number two, psionics. Kryptonians are vulnerable to psychic and telekinetic attacks. Superman may be stronger than most things in existence. His mind is still just as capable of being brainwashed like most of us. He's vulnerable to magic, so when it comes to psionic attacks, those tend to work against the Man of Steel in a similar manner. Telekinesis can attack Superman's molecular structure, so when the damage is on a microscopic level, it's hard to overcome and pinpoint. The Green Lantern ship at one point took over the Kryptonian's mind in issue 10 of Injustice Gods Among Us year two. He's small but mighty, but he can also think small, so you're kinda screwed. And number one, you guessed it, Kryptonite. Most of us heard the song Kryptonite by Three Doors Down growing up. In fact, now that I mentioned it, it's probably stuck in your head. So good. My first song I ever learned on guitar. That's right, Kryptonite. Okay, since the final days of Krypton, its remains were now deemed radioactive after the whole explosion thing, and parts of Kryptonite were now floating around in space. This crystalline substance has a specific radioactive wavelength that's lethal to those who are native to its reality. The most common form is the type we see in Batman vs Superman. It's called bright green kryptonite, and it's poison to Kal-El. In the comic Batman and Superman issue 44, he gets a blast of kryptonite shards to the face, and it does not look pleasant in any manner.